How many of you um, are here for your first time? This is your first G4G. G. Thank, thank you. You know, just like all of you, if it wasn't for Martin Gardner, I wouldn't be here today. I, I guess I never get tired of that joke, and it only works here. So. What I'm going to try to do is, is I've put together some images of dad that can help spark some of my memories of what it was like growing up uh, with Martin Gardner for your father. And then at the end, I've, I've got a very interesting problem that hopefully someone might be able to help me with. But essentially, uh, this is who I grew up with. Martin Gardner, the polymath. Martin Gardner, who was involved in all of these areas. And I, and I often tell people when I'm trying to describe who dad was, is, is I say, in certain situations, people had no idea who he was. And then in other contexts, contexts he was a rock star. So unfortunately, if he, if he was stopped for speeding, he wouldn't get out of the ticket, like maybe Tammy Wyatt or some, someone else known in Oklahoma for other things. But that was with Dad. Now, one of the coolest things I remember was, was in fifth grade, because I should step back and say, Dad was not the sort of person who would brag or who would tell me, oh, guess what, I published another book today. Or I spoke to so-and-so on the telephone, who's a Nobel laureate. But one of the coolest things was coming to school and the order for that month's Arrow Books came in and suddenly the Arrow Book of Brain Teasers was being carried around by a whole bunch of other kids in my grade. And of course, I didn't even know that was coming because I probably didn't pay enough attention to the order sheet that went home. But that I remember very vividly as a, as a cool thing. I don't know why, I don't think Dad did this, but then I remember another Arrow book came out of, of other science gags or whatever and the next day, about 30 kids came to school with um, the mummy's finger. Do you, do you all, do, does that spark anything in anybody's mind? You take a jewelry box and you cut a hole and you stick your finger up in and fold it over and then you take, what was it, calamine lotion? And you put it all over and it looks like an old withered dead finger. But 50 other kids come to school with that. So, you know, what were some of Dad's literary heroes? He had many, but the four that I remember, and these are in no particular order of importance, were William James, uh, which, which was very interesting because I really didn't learn this until my second son was born and we named him William after my wife's father, and then James after my grandfather. So it was William James, and Dad remarked that was such a wonderful name because he was such a fan of William James. G.K. Chesterton, Dad loved Chesterton mysteries, and in fact annotated one or two books about Chesterton stories. And of course, L. Frank Baum, and Lewis Carroll, Carroll, who we've heard many times. Yeah, Lewis Carroll, uh, oh well. Um, I'm, and I have to apologize, I may cough. It's allergy season, and I've got it tip top. But certainly Dad's love for the Wizard of Oz was, was very central to, to my life and interaction with him. And, and I made a mistake at a couple G4Gs ago where I mentioned that Dad learned to read looking over my grandmother reading to him um, Lewis Carroll's book, Alice in Wonderland. And I was incorrect. I just, I don't know why I said that. It was The Wizard of Oz, and that is mentioned specifically in Undiluted Hocus Pocus. 
And dad so thoroughly liked Oz that at one point he decided he was going to write his own Oz book. And it's Visitors of Oz. And it starts out where Dorothy, the Cowardly Lion, the Tin Woodman, um, are, and the Scarecrow all take a venture walking on a Klein bottle. And at one point, it catapults them to, among other places, New York City. Uh, and unfortunately, one chapter, they mentioned Rudy Giuliani. Um, <laughs> back when he was, I guess, more positive. And then, of course, we know that uh, with the help of Mark Bernstein, um, who added uh, some additional notes based on the theme, that it would be likely that someone would have sent this note to Martin Gardner, as well as we put together some other ones that appeared in separate publications. We came out with this absolutely beautiful publication for the 150th anniversary of um, Lewis Carroll. Here are a couple Lewis Carroll themed photos that were taken over the years for different editions of Dad's Alice in Wonderland. That one didn't make it, but it's one of my favorites. <clears throat> uh, this was taken by Scott Morris, who used to attend a number of uh, the Gardner gatherings. I think this was for the, uh, the definitive edition. Then another one. This is a sculpture of Alice in Wonderland that is located in Central Park, New York. I, I always get a kick out of this. People ask me, well, how did, how did your dad work? How did he write? What made him so prolific? And if you had asked dad, he said, well, I don't have any real schedule or anything. Well, that was probably how he saw things because Dad thoroughly enjoyed to read and do research, and he thoroughly enjoyed his writing. And so to him, it was just another wonderful day. But I would say that typically it was up for breakfast with the New York Times that was delivered to the house. He'd go upstairs to the third floor in our house in Hastings on Hudson to work, lunch around noon, back upstairs to work, almost four o'clock shop sharp. It was cocktails with my mother, Charlotte, and he would spend some time working the afternoon cryptogram that appeared at that time, I think it was the Herald Statesman or the Herald Tribune that was an afternoon paper that was delivered. And the, a funny story about that was is that was the only thing Dad got that paper for. He didn't read anything else. And apparently, at one point, he said he wrote a letter to the editor asking or suggesting that all they needed to do was just tear out the cryptogram and deliver that page to his house, and it would be fine. And I get, I, the editor called him back because he recognized who he was and respectfully said, I, I'm afraid we can't do that, but we understand the nature of that. Um, then he'd go back upstairs for a brief working session while mom made dinner. We had an early dinner. He'd go upstairs for additional work and then usually would go to bed where he'd lie in the bed uh, propped up reading or doing additional proofreading or, or other notes for probably his monthly Scientific American column or something else. <coughs> so a couple things that I recollect at various locations across Hastings and Hudson and then Hendersonville, North Carolina are some things that were in his office in no order of significance. 
Um, I certainly remember that on his desk was a very nice wooden edition of Pete Hines' Soma Cube. And that was one of the puzzles that I remember spending probably more time with of the many puzzles that came through our house. And, and people often remarked they'd get to the house expecting to see puzzles everywhere, and they would see a dearth of puzzles. And what it really was is that a puzzle, a puzzle would come through, dad would spend whatever time he felt that was needed to understand the puzzle, to get a sense of how it worked, and then very likely when a next house guest came through with a different puzzle that they'd leave for dad, dad would give them that puzzle as a gift. So he was always extremely generous with things that people gave to him uh, because he knew that other people would likely appreciate it more than he did. Now Pete Hine actually came and stayed with us two times. Um, he, he came and visited Dad when he was doing some work in, in New York City uh, on two different occasions. And, and I, I remember him very vividly because for whatever reason, he decided that my brother Tom and I did not have proper Danish toys that, that kids would grow up with. So all of a sudden, one day, he showed up coming back from New York, and I guess he had stopped in FAO Schwartz, and along came a pair of stilts, um, something else, and then another thing that's called uh, the Diablo, which uh, it's, you, if you've gone to Cirque du Soleil, you've seen this, and I understand some of our entertainers tonight will also be using that. And I became actually pretty proficient uh, in that particular thing. One of the other areas that Dad, I think, had a strong relationship with Pete Hine was Pete Hine was also a polymath. And in, in addition to um, his mathematical side, where he's credited with either inventing or popularizing um, the super egg, which is a particular type of ellipse. Is it the super ellipse? Did I get it right? Thank you, Bob. But he also had a fondness for Pete Hines' poems with images called Grooks. And in the first Grook book that came out circa, nine, I think, 1966, one of the po poems in there is The Miracle of Spring. And if you take a short amount of time to read this, you will note that this is the poem that appears in Dad's memoir's autobiography, where he chose to entitle it Undiluted Hocus Pocus. This was the inspiration for that that came from Pete Hine. Um, this was Dad's use of technology, and it was mentioned later on, I finally got him to, to use a personal computer. I had an old Apple uh, Cube, and what got him to use it was the fact that Scientific American had come out with the CD of all his columns. And so dad could insert that, and he had, he had elaborate instructions of how to find it, how to get to the programs. Uh, he would be able to look up things to remind him what he wrote in previous things. But dad did do word processing, and these were dad's word processing um, tools. Um, rubber cement, a pair of scissors. Whoops, we jumped ahead and I can't, I don't know how to get back. But the way that dad word processed was he would type out a page and then if he determined that a couple sentences needed to be corrected, if he couldn't hand correct it, he would retype the new sentences that would appear in that space and then he would cut it out and he'd rubber cement it and just paste it over where it would be on the master page. Um, Dad never used the push button telephone. 
throughout his entire life, he used a, uh, this, is a this is a dial phone, if you've never seen this, if your daughter, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you know, that's actually what a telephone used to look like. And it, and it, you know, even before we had the, these crazy telemarketers, he would occasionally get a phone call that would say, we'd like to remind you of your doctor's appointment uh, this coming Thursday. Press one if you're going, press two. And he could never do that. He couldn't get the phone. He, he, he had challenges with that. This was the head's calculator. Um, when Dad, I remember uh, on more than one occasion, walking up to his office because I, I might need to get some stamps that he kept in a lectern, small little lectern on top of a, um, a, a, an engineering or draft table that he had, and, and he'd be balancing the checkbook, the family using a, a calculator. Here's something new. Um, how did dad keep everybody's information? Well, he used a Rolodex. And in fact, I still have dad's Rolodex. And, and what I did, based somewhat on name recognition in other contexts, uh, I just thought you might be interested to see who are some of the names that I recognized in Dad's Rolodex? Oh, well, that's what it looks like. That happens to be my old house and address. Um, I don't know if you can, can people read names up there? So let's take, just take a 30 seconds or a minute. Can you read them to us? You want me to read them to you? Okay, um, well, Elwin Burlkamp, Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke and Dad were part of a um, author's group called the Trapdoor Spiders, who met uh, six or seven times a, a year for dinner meetings where they discussed various topics and office invited one or two people to be grilled um, and James Randi uh, attended, I think, on a couple occasions and considered himself an honorary member. John Conway, Percy Diaconis, Richard Guy, and no, I thought that was kind of not a doctor. Well, we heard about that. I think it was more he didn't want to refer to him as Dr. Guy, Ron Graham, Michael Hearn, Michael Patrick Hearn, who did the annotated Alice, annotated Wizard of Oz, excuse me, Ray Hyman, one of the original Psychops founders, Doug Hofstadter, Frank Jacobs, does anyone recognize that name? Frank, Frank Jacobs was one of the editors for Mad Magazine, and among other things, Frank Jacobs was responsible for at the very last page of Mad Magazine, you would fold, do folding things a certain way. So if you read Humpty Dumpty Magazine when you were growing up, Dad did almost all the folding and the cutout activities in Humpty Dumpty Magazine. So I suspect that he and Frank would often talk about different options. Um, Magician Ricky Jay, Scott Kim, Don Knuth, Max Maven. All right, now here's the problem. I'm going to have to look down here. Harry Lorraine, he was a mentalist. Um, calm, mole, mole, I'm not sure I can pronounce that properly. <laughs> no, calm, mole, kahi. Um, Bob Orban, who was a, a joke writer, and I can't remember, might have worked for Kennedy or uh, LBJ. Roger Penrose, Tom Rogers, um, James Randi, Peter Lentz, um, Dana, oh, another person, Dana Richards. Dr. Stephen Turner, Steve's often been here. He is a big Escher expert and collector. Michael Shermer, Doris Schatzenberger, Will Shorts from the New York Times, Raymond Smolian, Marilyn 
Vaux Savoy. And when, when I originally did this, I tried to line them up. I realized afterwards, literally going out of the house, that there were probably two other people who it might be fair to mention. Those are a little harder. Um, John, what is it? Um, Gollum, the mathematician, and Bill Gosper. Um, so I would also like to mention, if you saw your name on here, um, please see me. And um, in memory of dad, I have your Rolodex card, and I would like you to have it, please. Um, so this was another question um, that some, it came up in the discussion, and uh, you know, did, did dad have a falling out with Scientific American? Why did he decide he wanted to retire? And I can tell you that it simply was after 25 years of having to take two weeks every month to write a Scientific American um, article, he just wanted to move and have a little more control of his life because he had many projects. And in fact, when I gave a talk about that at the MoMath, um, one of the then editors of Scientific American came up to me and he said, I wanted you to have it. And it was copies of dad's letter as well as the, um, not, uh, when I have to, one of my learning disabilities is when I have to retrieve a name, I can't retrieve the name. Um, it was a memo or a letter, letter to the then, I think, publisher, Gerald Pyle, and it starts out with the caption, uh, something along the lines of the letter I've been disturbed to get, or it was more like the letter I have always expected would eventually come. And it was dad's resignation letter. But in there, I found some interesting information. So just take maybe 15, 20 seconds and think who might have been someone that dad recommended to take over his column. And we're going to learn three of those names, because I think there might have been more. And I think we all know Douglas Hofstadter, I think, was the next person to start doing it on a permanent basis for a year or two. And it's not Douglas Hofstadter. You don't have to, you're, you ready? You want the reveal? Donald Knuth was one of those individuals, although dad said he, he suspected that Knuth would more than likely not. Um, the next in person is, Roar, is Ross Horsenberger, someone from Canada. That name doesn't ring a bell to me, but I thought that was interesting. And then look who's the third person. So in honor, we also can say yet one more accolade for Richard Guy that he was one of the individuals that dad recommended might uh, be able or interested in continuing his column. It, we may run over five minutes if that's okay. I just wanna let you, let you know. So what were some of the wall art and images? Well, if you saw, of course everyone knows that uh, when dad wrote his Escher column, he corresponded with Escher and actually purchased an Escher. The interesting story is at that time, um, the art editor for, um, for Scientific American didn't get Escher, didn't think Escher would amount to anything. And so, yeah. And the comment was, he asked my dad how much he paid. 
And this was his response. You paid too much. Now, I actually contacted the Escher Foundation, and they have a record of dad buying the print in 61, and it roughly was $500. So let me ask you, do you think an Escher is worth just $500 these days? So obviously, uh, I have no idea who, uh, where that art editor is working. Um, dad had a, a, um, a friend who took this photograph of um, Einstein on the day he became an American citizen. It hang, hangs promptly, it hung promptly on his wall. It hangs in the wall of my office. And he said what was interesting is when Einstein got up, he noticed he, Einstein was wearing no socks. Um, Dad had a photo of L. Frank Baum, uh, which he gave to Michael Hearn, and then this is w another one that he got that is autographed, I think, by Baum's great-great-grandson. Um, in one of the other um, Hastings on Hudson libraries, Dad had this map of the land of Oz that I remember as a young boy always pausing to look at because I learned to read on the Oz series. Uh, and then a photo of William James, I still have that. This was something done, maybe I'm not sure which magazine, but this was something put together to appear in either a article about him or one of uh, some of his puzzles that appeared with that. Uh, this was given to him. This was the cover of uh, his more annotated Alice. Um, this is a solution to how many cuts to divide a donut. Uh, and, and I'm going to apologize to Bill because I don't think I have time to show the video. Um, but this hangs. I still have it. Um, and this was a puzzle that you cut it out, the top one, and you'll notice that you see uh, five Cheshire cats. But then when you rearrange the top row, or about the top third, you get three Cheshire cats, and only that which appears is the cat's grin. I do have a video of that. If you'd like to see it, I'd be happy to, to show you, but I'm going to... I'm going to move past that if I can. Uh, and then, um, amongst Dad's art on the whimsical side was um, when I was very young, apparently, and this is not it, uh, he took one of my kindergarten or preschool finger paints and had it framed. And it was among the other art, and people would stop and say, well, that's a very interesting piece. <laughs> And Dad would say, yes, it is. I, I happen to know the artist um, uh, on that. Now, the question, take a look here. What do these people have in common? Well, I will, I will tell you because I have the solution to that. These individuals are part of the amazing deck. And when they were putting together the um, An Honest Liar, a story about James Randi, one of their promotions to help earn funds was they put together a deck of cards that people could purchase. And certain cards were of relevant people to Randi. And I actually, um, I, I gave permission and everything, and they very graciously sent me a, the proof, or one of the prints of the entire deck that I had framed. And so the king of clubs is Martin Gardner, and of course the joker is James Randi. Um, what were some things in, Martin, in Dad's closet? Well, Dad got many awards, he got honorary degrees, they were just all in a box in his closet <laughs> because it, they were, I mean, they were important to him, but he was not the type to put them up, up on the wall. Now, my bookshelves, and I've cut it out um, for this. 
um, I, I've invested a lot of money in IKEA. I cut out the center one, but if if you look at these rows starting right about there, um, those are all copies of dad's books, various copies that he got. Uh, and of course, he had over 50, 60, 60 books. Uh, oh, and in there, so one day I, I have this vague memory going into New York City to an event when we were all learning to do origami. I was maybe five or six. Well, it was the launch of Lillian Oppenheimer and Sherry Lewis's two books on origami. Um, I still have copies of some of Dad's earliest magic pamphlets that he put together and sold. <coughs> and then this was an interesting collection. This is a book that Dad later wrote a foreword, The Upside Down of Gustav Verbeck, which I remember on a rainy day going in, and he had versions of this. And what was so interesting is the way that these worked is you read the story, and then you flipped it upside down, and the story continued. Here's a close up. So here's one where um, he's reaching for a, a fish attacking him, and then upside down, with which was the uh, girl, uh, the bird is, is picking, um, picking her up. Now, the other thing was often said, what were in Martin Gardner's pockets? And, oh, would, um, would you excuse, I'm, I'm getting a low battery warning for my Apple electronic watch. Would you wait a second, please? Okay, I think it's gonna run now. So in Dad's pockets, almost off, was what's called a watch winder, a thumb tip, a pack of matches to do bar bets and other magic tricks with paper matches, and he did a variety of things with handkerchiefs. And that's my Aunt Judy, and Dad is showing her some sort of goofy face that he invented using, using a handkerchief. Uh, the whimsical side of Dad. Uh, Robert Kreese wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago. Uh, if you want to see that article, really quickly you can take a photo of, of the, um, not a PDF, uh, QR code, and you'll be able to pull it up. And Michael Fallon did the caricature of Dad. And I happened to find it and I was enamored greatly by it, and I wrote to the, um, did I say Wall Street Journal? Was it, it wasn't the Wall Street Journal, was it the Wall Street Journal? I wrote to them and I said, listen, I'd like to get this. They put me in touch with Michael Fallon, and he very graciously, after we talked, and wanted, you know, kind of, he did some studying on, on Dad, was, gave me an amazing, very reasonable price, and that particular piece original hangs in my house right now. Um, the, the whimsical side of Dad, uh, I came across this in his files, and two things that I found interesting, and, and Dad would get requests, and he had a form letter, is uh, he will not put the reader in touch with Dr. Matrix, and he will make only make trips to Manhattan except under extreme provoca provocation. So he regret that he wouldn't be able to do that. There's Martin Gardner's April Fool's column, where among other things, of course people didn't know it was an April Fool's column, where people got very elaborate instructions to how to make a engine that would take their psychic energy to create a psychic motor. Uh, and among it, you'll note that he talks about um, that the Russian experts are convinced that energy turns the motor in a way that Yuri Geller does things. He mentions Randy. Uh, it talks about your mental state, et cetera. 
And of course, that was, that was all a hoax. Uh, and they, they also got an illustrated Scientific American to say that Leonardo da Vinci um, created the flush toilet. So <laughs> I got back from college that summer um, and a, a couple months later, Ed was upstairs talking with Dad, and across the floor were these piles of letters. And, and Dad said, yes, I did this column, and, and this stack of letters are people who absolutely loved it. This stack of letters are people who wanted more information <laughs> about some of the things. And he said, this stack of letters are people who wrote to Scientific American saying that Dad should be fired for doing such a hoax uh, <laughs> on them. So here's some other images and photos. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly uh, at, to get to the last intriguing thing that I mentioned. Uh, you know, there's, we've seen this one. Uh, we did, we had a meeting of the board at my house uh, a few years back. Uh, this is the domino photo by Ken Knowlton. Uh, but board members came and did some really marvelous community service events, giving a community lecture about Dad and also talking in different areas. You'll recognize a number of folks. This is one from one of the early um, G4Gs. Um, I, what do you, do you think, is that John Conway? You think, okay, John Conway. There's Dad and Ray Hyman, I guess John Conway. Dad and who's that? Tom Rogers. And Tom was out with the other group of people. You'll recognize Mark Sedakati over there, out to visit Dad and Norman. Uh, nice one. They're all, they're all nice. This one I kind of like. I just came across it because you'll just barely see down kind of where there is a silver ring, and Dad had a silver ring that was a Moebius strip. And later on, uh, I, I had to have a surgery, and they had to cut my gold wedding ring off, and um, I had it remelted and made an image of Dad's uh, Moebius strip ring, and that is now my replacement wedding ring, and I'm happy to show it to anyone. Dad and Jay Marshall, the magician, early at a Tannins convention. Uh, I think this was from Hendersonville. Dad, when he got his honorary degree at Bucknell University. Um, one of my favorite ones of Elliot Erwitt, and you can see in the background the um, Albert Einstein. Here's uh, Dad doing one of his common spoon levitations. Dad also levitating a card. Um, now we're getting to some of my really favorite ones of Dad. Another one by Elliot Erwitt. A different view of that. I like that one with all the little gadgets and things. This is probably my absolute favorite one of Dad. Um, that's me on the far left, my brother Tom, my mother Charlotte, and dad. Um, which gets me to the G for G14 revelation, where I need some, I need some assistance. Um, first off, the address in Hastings-on-Hudson, many people knew, was 10 Euclid Avenue. And as we may know, that if we take Euclid and we take the corresponding number for the letter, we end up getting 67. Anything unique about 67? It's a prime number. So just before, I, I got a very strange email. I almost didn't look at it uh, from someone saying, and I have no idea who it was, that it had been 80 years and they wanted to reveal something unbeknownst to me or dad that there was something about the phone number 
at 10 Euclid that it was specifically created for him, which dad had never mentioned. And I have no idea where that came from, but it said, I'm an old friend of your father's. So if anyone had been around and ever called dad at 10 Euclid, this was our number, 914-478-0842. And there was an attachment that walked me through some elaborate things uh, that I've tried to summarize here. So here's the phone number. And if we take four, seven, and eight, and we add those together, we get the number 19. And if you look next to it, is the number 14. 1914, what year was dad born? 1914, yeah, you know. So if you take the nine and the one, again, the center, and add those together, you get 10. What's the 10th month? October, that's the month dad was born in. Now, I always remembered the last four numbers very easily because zero, eight, you have eight, you get four, you have four, you get two. So with this having, if you take 42 and have that, you get 21. What's dad's birthday? October 21st, 1914. But wait, there's more. So, again, that's the phone number. But if you take that number and you reorder it starting from the last going backwards, you get that number. We have any math whizzes or anything here? Well, it just so happens that's a prime number. <laughs> and, and then I look back, I, I look back at this message, and I misread it. I thought, I'm an old friend of your father, but there's no apostrophe. I'm FN, friend of your father. And the only thing that I can think of is those are the person's initials. I am, who is I am? Iva Matrix? And so I actually think that dad's phone number somehow was purposefully concocted by Dr. Irving Josiah Matrix. So that's the revelation for the evening. You've been very patient with me uh, going on. Uh, this is a wonderful quote. Uh, of dads um, that, that Nancy has often chose to also cite, and I also like to bring it up because it captures math, magic, and paradoxes, and it's the end, but I am happy to take a, a, a short amount of time to answer any questions anybody else might have ab about dad, and I'll try to repeat. I am Mikey Ivan Moscovich. Oh, well, that, yeah, could be. Question, yeah, question, any questions at the mic on that? All right, well, thank you very much. It's, it's always a pleasure. Um, and um, 